we have been looking at indefinite integrals and how that relates to the antiderivative, the opposite of a derivative. So what we could take the derivative of to get back to our original function. Today, we're gonna to look at area under the curve and a definite integral and how this kind of relates to um, integration. So first, let's think about this graph right here. And let's say that we wanted to find the area underneath that curve from x equals negative three to three. And we're given that this function is f of x is equal to negative x squared plus nine. We wanna find the area bounded between the curve and the x-axis between x equals negative three and three of the area. And usually the way they'll write this in interval notation, so bracket negative three comma three. So we don't know how to find that area. We could probably estimate that area and we can estimate that area by using shapes that we know how to find the area. So for instance, let's say we know how to find the area of rectangles and rectangles are pretty easy to find the area, right? So the area of a rectangle we know is length times width. And so let's say that we wanna break this up into maybe let's say six different intervals and six different rectangles. And there's, this is what we're gonna be getting down to is to, to make rectangles underneath this area in the curve. And the more the rectangles we make, the better um, accurate we'll get with the estimate underneath that curve. And there's a couple ways of writing that rectangle under the curve. Let's start with the right endpoint. So first I said, let's make six rectangles. So we're gonna let n equal the number of rectangles. And in my case, we're gonna, in this case, let's first start with n equals six. Or actually, let's even start lower. Let's look at n equals two. So we wanna make two rectangles underneath this curve. Let's say we start with the right endpoint. So our first rectangle is gonna be between negative three and zero. And our next rank rectangle is gonna be between zero and three. If I choose, I wanna choose my height of my rectangle to be somewhere on my graph. So let's say I choose the height to be where x is zero. So my first rectangle in here, I'm gonna write, is that height is when x is zero on my function. And so this would be my first rectangle. If I chose my, and I chose this to be the right endpoint of my interval, that would mean my right endpoint for the next rectangle would be here, which actually is, doesn't make really a rectangle. And so I would find the area of this and I would say, okay, well, that's some approximation, not very good, of what this area underneath this curve is, which we're trying to find. So we want that area and we're saying, well, it's approximately what this one rectangle is. So when n is equal to two, and this we're looking at, oops, right endpoint. Let's try to find what we, we say that area is. Well, again, area length times width for a rectangle. And if we look at the width of this, right, from negative three to zero, that is three. And the height right here, well, that's that y value of our function. So this is at f of zero. 
And if I plug in zero, we can see that that is actually nine on there. But if I plug in zero here, wherever I see an X in my function, I get that is nine. So this is equal to nine. So for the right-hand endpoint, we have the area of this rectangle, which is the area is gonna be, let's say just two is approximately, and let's say that two tells me how many rectangles we use, is gonna equal to three times nine, which is equal to 27. Plus this area here, but this height is zero times our length of three. So that is just zero. So I didn't even think about that. Okay, so let's look at it. That's, that's an approximation of what that area in pink is. Um, what I colored in pink. Let's look at it now that if we break it up into six different rectangles. Sorry, I had a sneeze. So n is equal to, we're gonna let the number of rectangles that we're gonna choose is six. And again, we're bounded between negative three and three and the x-axis. And again, let's choose our, our height of our rectangle to be the right-hand end of our interval for that rectangle. So one rectangle is gonna be between negative three and negative two negative two and negative one, negative one and zero, zero, one, one to two, two to three. So the, how I can find that and what that length of each is, is if our intervals are from A to B, we would look at this length and we can find that length by looking at your B value um, minus your A value. And if we divide by the number of rectangles in, this would give us that width or that, that length of the base of our rectangle. And they denote this in your book with a triangle X. So this is equal to the base of the rectangle. So in our case, right, where our value was between negative three and three, our base of the rectangle is equal to three minus negative three, all over how many rectangles we wanted, which was six. And so this would give us three minus negative three is six, six divided by six is one. So that length is one. And so from negative three to plus one is negative two, et cetera. So that's how we got that. Um, so again, I said, let's use the right endpoint. And so we're looking at the height of our function at the right. So if I look at the right endpoint of this first rectangle, that would hit up here. So now I would go to the next, um, rectangle, the end point to the right of that in, um, rectangle is, is negative one. So that hits up here. So you're gonna keep doing that. Go to the right of where the rectangle is, find where it hits the graph. That's the height of it and then make your rectangle. And we can find that height by plugging those X values back into our function. Okay, so we can say that the area with six rectangles gives us the area that's approximately, that's the whole area that we're trying to find. And this is gonna equal 
base time height of each one of these. So let's call this A sub one. So A sub one, that area, that is, so it will be the area of A sub one plus A sub two, all the way up to A sub six. So the area of one, well, again, our base is one times our height, which this would be F of negative two plus our base, which is one, F of the next endpoint, which is negative one, plus one times F of zero, base one times F of one, plus base one of F of two, plus base one of F of three. Our f of x value, recall, was equal to negative x squared plus nine. In this case, our base is one. But if our base was other than one, notice that um, it's easier if we actually factor it out. So we could factor that one out, but because it's one, it's just whatever the other is anyway. So we don't really would do that. So this would be f of negative two. So if you plug in negative two, wherever you see an x here, you get negative two quantity squared, which is four with a negative out front. So that's negative four plus nine. So we get five. So one times five is five. Plus now looking at this area of two, for this rectangle. So we're looking at one times F of negative one. So if you plug in negative one here, square it, it's one with a negative in front. So negative one plus nine is eight. Eight times one is eight. Plus F of zero, plugging in zero into this equation, we get back nine. F of, so that's area three. The area under A sub four, that is f of one, one squared is one, negative in front, so negative one plus nine is eight. The area of the rectangle five, that is the area, so um, base is one times a height, plugging in two, so two squared is four with a negative in front, negative four plus five, um, sorry, negative four plus nine is five. And then the last one, again, this is where our base is one, but our height at f of three is zero. So we would really be just adding zero. So we don't really have to write that. So if we approximate this by finding this area, we're saying that is an estimate of what that area under the curve, negative x squared plus nine is between negative three and three. So summing this up, let me just see. So five plus five is 10, 10 plus eight plus eight, which is 16, that's 26, 26 plus nine um, is 35. So we can continue this process. We can say, okay, well now let's say maybe we want, and I don't wanna draw it, but a hundred different rectangles under there. And so if you start doing so many rectangles under there, and we could actually make it go to infinity by limits, because we know limits, we can get basically the exact area under the curve. And that's the whole process of this definite integral. And I just really wanted you guys to get kind of an idea of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and so again, if you start to put in an infinite number of rect rectangles in here, it's basically going to give you that whole shaded region. So we want to set up some so sort of formula so that, that this would work. So we want the number of rectangles. to 
go to infinity. So remember, we could write that as a limit. N goes to infinity, the number of those rectangles. We want to sum all of these rectangles. I don't know if you guys remember, but there is a notation that helps us sum. And that is a capital sigma, so sigma. So if this said n equals one to, let's just say three for now. All this is saying is I am summing if I plug in one for F, plus if I plug in two for X, or N in this case, plus if I plug in three. So it's just summation. So we're gonna write this would be the summation of all these different rectangles that we're doing of those rectangles. So we need to look at that. So that was plugging in the endpoint <clears throat> of our interval. So how do we write that? Well, there's different ways to rewrite this, but let's just say that x sub i Yeah, so x sub i is the endpoint of the rectangle. We just dealt with right endpoints, but there's left endpoints, there's midpoints. It actually really doesn't matter what point you choose. When it becomes infinite, it's gonna be about the same height, wherever you choose it. And so this is falling in between those X values of our bounds. So we saw that the height of that rectangle was plugging in the X value back into our original function times that change in X, what that length of that interval was. And we saw that that was, we could denote that with a triangle X. Okay, so this right here is actually the definition of our definite interval. Let me just write that. Okay, so the definite interval. So it says if F is defined, on an interval, let's call that interval AB, the definite integral of F from A to B is given by Okay, so we're going to use our integral sign that we were doing for our indefinite integral. But now we're going to write on here the lower bound of our interval. So where we're starting, so at x equals a to the end bound of the interval we're looking at, which in this case is b. So a is going to go on the bottom of that elongated s shape, and b is going to go on the top of the function f of x dx. This is equal to looking at the limit as n goes to infinity with the summation 
and this should have been in my case this should have been an n Yeah, maybe not. And they say from I equals one to N of F of X sub I, name's triangle X. Okay, so it's provided that the limit has to exist Limit as n goes to infinity exists. And where the, okay, let me just write this. Where the limit has n goes to infinity of f of x exists. Sorry, not f of x exists. And where this triangle X change in X is equal to B minus A all over N. And X of I is any value of X in the ith interval. Okay, so in this class, we are not going to look at looking at the summations and looking um, at the limit of those those triangles going to infinity. We'll do some finite values in this class. If you end up watching a video of my class with um, STEM calculus, you'll see me going through more of this process and we actually look at the limits and stuff, but we're not going to do that in this class. I just want you guys to kind of have a foundation of really what we're doing when we're looking at that definite integral or if we're trying to find an area under a curve. Okay, so we're looking at an example. We're gonna find the area between the curve and the x-axis using the method with n equals four, so four different rectangles. We're gonna use A, the left endpoint, which we haven't talked about, B, the right endpoint, which we have been using, C, the average of the answers from using the left and the right endpoints, and then using the, the midpoint. We're gonna first look at the, an, an easier example where we have f of x is equal to three x plus two, and we're looking at the area under that curve between x equals one and x equals three. So first thing that you wanna do is it would be helpful to get a graph of this to see what's going on. So let's do that. Well, this is in the form, recall, if we have something in the form of y equals mx plus b, we can tell what the y-intercept is. Our y-intercept here is at two. And we can see our slope is three or three over one. So I know when X is two, I would rise up three and go over one. Maybe I shouldn't, let me give me myself a little more room. So I go up three and over one. up three and over one, sorry. Up three and over one. Or we could go down three and over one. Look at this. I'm a little off of my graph, but that's okay. It's a line. Oops. 
just do this. It told us that we wanted four rectangles. And we know that our bounds was between one and three. So the length of our, the base of our rectangles is going to be three minus one all over four. So three minus one, that is two, and two over four is a half. So let's first look at the, the left endpoint. So the left endpoint of our rectangle is going to be at the furthest to the left of the base of that rectangle. And let's make these four rectangles before we do this, or just kind of four mark, tick marks. So if I'm starting at one and I add a half to it, that's going to be where the, the end of the base is. So that's going to be at 1.5 or one and a half. And then we're gonna have one at two, two to 2.5, and then 2.5 to three. So left end point, I would start here um, where the graph hits on the left. So the height is gonna be where I hit the graph on the left, and that's gonna be the height of my first rectangle. The height of my rec um, second rectangle, I'm going to find the height when x is 1.5, which is right here. That's going to be the height of my second rectangle. The third rectangle, the height is going to be at x equals 2. And the fourth rectangle, the height is going to be at x equals 2.5. And so if we find this area, I'm going to just say four left. Um, and that's probably not how they notate it, but I'm, that's how I'm going to do it a, with a subscript 4L. Just saying that that's what we were using our endpoints of our base to be. So it's the change in x, which is 1 half. Remember I said we can factor that out all times. Well, we want to look at f of 1, the height there, plus the height at f of 1.5, plus f of 2, plus f of 2.5. And we're plugging that into our equation f of x, which is 3x plus 2. So this is equal to a half. f of 1, if I plug in 1, wherever I see an x, I get 3 times 1, which is 3, plus 2 is 5. So f of 1 is 5 f of 1.5. Oh, that's going to be a little harder, but it's not bad. So 3 times 1.5. That is 4.5. No, that's not. 15. That yeah, is. Something's wrong, right? This y value is higher than this y value. Oh wait, and then I add my two, sorry, plus two. Okay, so 6.5 plus f of two. So plugging in two here, three times two is six, six plus two is eight, plus three times 2.5, so that's 7.5, 7.5 plus two is 9.5. I could have just added 1.5 to each one of these. Right. Um, this is equal to one half. And so if we sum this up, five plus eight, that's 13. And then we have that 13 plus 6.5 plus 9.5, 
which is 16. So 16 plus 16 gives me, sorry, why did I say 16? 16 plus 13 is 29. So this would give us 29 halves. which is 14 and one half units squared. Okay, so that's the first one. That was just the left endpoints. Now we wanna use the right endpoints. So the right endpoints, when you're using the right endpoints, you're going to the right point of your interval the base of this rectangle. Oops. So let's write that out. So the area for rectangles, and we're using the right end point. So our base is still one half, so one half all times. But this time, our height of our first rectangle, we're gonna use as the right end point. So the right in point. So notice that the pinkish reddish color I used, that was underestimating the area a little bit. And when we're using the right end point, in this case, we're overestimating the area a little bit. It's going above. And so right endpoint, we're going to look at f of 1.5 plus f of 2 plus f of 2.5 plus f of 3. We've already found a lot of these values. f of 1.5 was 6.5. f of 2 was 8. F of 2.5 was 9.5, F of three. So three times three is nine plus two is 11. So a half times 6.5 plus 9.5, that's 16, 16 plus 19. And my brain is not working today. <laughs> so I'm just gonna plug things in so I don't mess up, so 35. So two goes into 35, 17 times, one half. Okay, let's write that, 35 halves. Part B wanted us to take the average of these answers. So the average, right? This is equal to summing up those two numbers. And divide by how many numbers we're summing, which in this case is two. So if we took 29 halves plus 35 halves, we divide that by two. Which you can write as two over one. So this is equal to 29 plus 35 is 64 all over two times, because we're dividing by a fraction, flip it up one half. So 64 fourths which is equal to, both of those have two in common. Actually, the um, four, does four go in there? Four goes in there evenly. Four goes into six once, for the remainder of two, and four goes into 24 six times. So the average of those two values is 16. So it should fall in between, right, halfway, which is halfway point. So we took something that underestimated a little bit, 
plus something that overestimated it a little bit, and then we took that average. The last portion of this said use the midpoint. So the midpoints is a little different. Instead, we're using the halfway mark in between. So for us, in this case, let me see if I can grab this and bring it down. So the midpoint is a halfway point between the bases. So between the base one and 1.5, we have this. And so that is going to be the height of the rectangle. So the base is still a half. So we're going to look at the area of four midpoints. So we have one half, which is our base, that length of each of those. But this is now going to be hitting at f of. 1.25. So if I go to the quarter mark between, or halfway mark between a half and two, that's 1.75. That's going to be the height of my rectangle in this case. So this is f of 1.75. So halfway mark is going to be where my height is. So looking at f of 2.25. And right here. So f of 2.75. So plugging in to our function f of x equals three times x plus two, we have three times 1.25 plus two gives us 5.75. Plus three times 1.75 plus two, that's gonna give us 7.25. plus three times 2.25 times, or plus two, that gives us 8.75. And three times 2.75 plus two gives us 10.25. So sum up what's inside the brackets. You get 32 and we have one half times 32, which is equal to 16, which looks like the same thing as our average of the two. And in the case, because this is linear, that make, to me makes sense. But the more rectangles we put under there, the better. We technically could find this area in here. Um, doesn't this look like, actually, yeah, a triangle. We can make this into a triangle. Technically, if we find this area in here, this triangle, right? And we can find out what that, that base is. And we can find out what that height is. So we can find the area of this bigger triangle in here. And then we could find the area of a smaller triangle in there. So this here, which we don't really want the area of, that's not part of our interval, we could subtract that off. And so we could find that exact area in this case but we also could use definite intervals, which I haven't given you 
the formula or how to do that without using summations yet. 